الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزلنا علما نافعا يا كريم Oh Allah, teach us what is beneficial to us and make us benefit from what you teach us and give us more beneficial knowledge. <coughs> uh, Alhamdulillah, we speak a lot about our children. Uh, the subject keeps coming. New generation of Muslims on a regular basis. And we all wonder about the future and eventually what we do, we should do. And as I said, the sisters, feel free to come down. If you want to be on this side, that's fine. Alhamdulillah, some of the brothers are just having a late dinner. That's good. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, just give me a second here. Allah reminds us in Surah Al-Tahreem, <coughs> saying, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ya ayuha al-lazina amanu qu anfusakum wa ahlikum naran wa quduha al-nasu wal hijarah. O you who believe, protect yourself and your family from a fire whose fuel is people and stone to the end of the verse. Now, if you notice in this very particular verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not making us responsible for all of humanity or all of the society or all our relatives or tribe or clan. Each one of us is responsible for himself or herself and his or her family. Not more than that. And if we do the job right, eventually each one of us does that. The society will be a strong society and a healthy one. And it turns to, it will influence eventually the, the humanity overall. And that's what happens in the cycle of civilizations. Every civilization that rises eventually, eventually, it will rise with great might, great discipline. Not as that, discipline. And for discipline, you have to literally raise children in the proper way throughout the cycle, whether it's an Islamic civilization or, or otherwise. So we have to be responsible for our own families. What you are about to see now, <clears throat> and it's just a picture, and you will see why this picture, and later on why another picture, and how our youth are influenced. Now what we see here, we see a non-Muslim group on the left, and a Muslim group on the right. And if you look, at, uh, you, you look at it well, you wonder if it were not for the hijab of the sisters who are wearing it, there will be no difference, basically, between the two. And we question ourselves. We say, what is it that we are not doing, okay? Or we are missing for our daughters eventually to wear what we are seeing on the screen. And we'll see it also for the boys. Now, this to tonight lecture is really, really to awaken our minds, we parents, that our children are under a great deal of stress. They are under a lot of pressure, peer pressure, social media pressure, you name it. School pressure, it's a lot of pressure. More than what we experienced ourselves. More than what we experienced ourselves who are from the older generation because we did have a whole community that was watching us. They don't have that in this society. They don't. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and let me just show you the next one, the, the next one about the boys. These are all Muslim uh, youth, by the way. Okay? Tremendous pressure is on them to do what? to follow. Allah, uh, the Prophet وسلم, said, الرَّجُلُ عَلَى دِينِ خَلِيلِهِ الرَّجُلُ عَلَى دِينِ خَلِيلِهِ فَلْيَنْظُرْ أَحَدُكُمْ مَنْ يُخَالِلْ فَلْيَنْظُرْ أَحَدُكُمْ مَنْ يُخَالِلْ A man follows the religion or the path of his friend, so each one of you should consider whom he befriends. I always tell the youth, for those who attend regularly the masjid, the prayer, and they are committed with their parents, 
and I used to be principal of Islamic schools, I would tell them, you know better than those who are outside of the Islamic circle. And you should choose your friends. You don't let your friends choose you. You don't let your friends choose you because you don't know what you may end up befriending and eventually the type of behavior that will brush off on you. So you should have the criteria, point one, two, three, four, and if you find it in someone that is a classmate or a neighbor, or, then you follow that person and you befriend them. Otherwise, you have to distance yourself because of the danger of what the Prophet ﷺ has referred to. Al-mar'u ala dini khalilih. Now, we question, what is this pressure that our youth are under? And you will be surprised that there are statistics and large companies, large businesses, okay, they invest big, big money, big money to, to literally observe the youth and monitor their habits and cater to, quote unquote, their needs. All right? I can click on this and have the website, it is uh, connected, but I will just show you some of these statistics which I prepared on, uh, on the same slide. I don't know if we can see them well. If you look at it, teenage consumer spending statistics, they are literally being studied, the youth. The total number of teenagers in 2017, what, that's what the statistics are showing, it's about 27 million around 27 million teenagers. The total US teen, the teenagers spending, products bought by and for the teens, that means products that they themselves buy, young teenagers, and also their parents or their friends, or you have $264 billion of spending. $264 billion of spending. Now, if any one of you brothers was in the fashion industry and you see this number, you say, I'm in a good business, right? They have a lot of purchasing power, tremendous purchasing power. The total U.S. annual teen income in the U.S., their income combined of these 27 is close to 100, million, 100 uh, billion. It's $92 billion and a half. It's amazing. The youth that we see, and the problem that I see with our community is that our community, Muslims, we always have the tendency to say, them and us. We are Muslims, you know, our kids are different. No, 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 we are not. This is no them and us. There is no them and us. This is the Muslims are part of the fabric of the United States of America. Our children are no different than the non-Muslim children in terms of what they want, what they would like to have, and what their needs are. There's no difference whatsoever. So we have to be very careful about that. And that's why we have to be more alert, more conscious, okay, about their behavior and what they see and what they do. The average annual income for teens between 12 and 14 years of age, they make up to $2,800. And that's a 12-year-old or a 13-year-old, okay? And then you have the 15 to 17, they make 4,900, close to $5,000 for those ones. So the annual amount of money families spend on teens for food, apparel, personal care items, and entertainment is 150, close to $158 billion. Lots of money, brothers, lots of money. Of course, this is a source of attraction to what? To marketeers? We're talking about marketing, we're talking about the clothing industry, we're perfume industry, the, the, the whatever, sports industry, all of this is very attractive to them. And they are going to cater to our teens. Employment statistics for the kids, percent of high school students who are employed, 18%. That was in 2017, as I said. Employment rate for teenagers during the month of July is close to 55%. That means it bumps up during summertime. They work, which is good, to make money so that they can spend. 
Did you notice that the youth, mashallah, they have the latest of the iPhone, the latest of the Android phones, the latest of the gadgets, they will have them. And I wish we had some youth with us here because they will tell you, if I cannot make the money for it, I'll make sure that mom and dad are going to pay for it. I'll make sure that mom and dad will pay for it. Percent of teens who qualify themselves as unemployed is only 28%. So look at these figures and think, think, we should all think how the kids, how the youth are thinking and how they are behaving and towards what end, what is the drive behind that? Okay. As I said again, it's all the electronics, it's all the fashion and so on and so forth. Teenage buying habits statistics. Percent of teens who have placed an online order in the past three months, 29%. Who has teenagers who purchase things online? I do. I do too. So, and they do it better than me, right? Uh, didn't you ever ask them to buy something for you? Can you take care of that, Habibi? <laughs> yeah, they would do that. They're very good at it. The teens who, could, who would choose a new pair of jeans over concert tickets, okay, 63%. Now about the girls between age and uh, 13 and 18, who bought 10 or more items of clothing in the past six months, 41%. For well, this is very high, very, very. At the age of 13, 14, in three months, mashallah. Percent of girls aged 13 and 18 who bought five to nine items of clothing in the past six months is 21%. And you can look at the rest. So basically, our teenagers are being observed for their behavior and catered to, to get what out of them is money. Now, the shocking thing is this last one, and I want parents to be aware of this, please. Percent of girls who would take $1,000, okay, and give it to the celebrities. That's 81% who are willing to do that. And then percent of girls who would accept $10,000 to break up with their boyfriends is 27%. We tell, it tells us what? That there is some type of illness. Okay. This attraction towards celebrities to a point where they can give this much and maybe even give themselves. This is very dangerous. And 81%, that's a lot. There is a nice documentary. It's called Merchants of Cool. If you can see it, it's a PBS documentary. It came years ago. I don't think they will do another one like that because it's very, very shocking. And that's why you see me written, writing in green. You may watch the full documentary using this link, but warning parents only. Now, the person whom you see in the picture, Robert McChesney, he, is a, he has a doctorate degree in sociology. And he speaks about this, about what is being promoted. And I'll quickly, very quickly, when they ask him, what is the emotional, spiritual, and ethical effect of having all of your authentic cultural artifacts sucked up into this machine? The machine of consumerism, literally. He said, his answer, he said, it really promotes the sort of world in which you don't think anything matters unless it serves your material gain, money. Why be honest? Why have integrity? Why care about other people? They don't care. They don't care if, and when I say they, it's all those who are pushing to make that financial gain. They don't care about the next generation being alcoholic or drug addict or doing promiscuous acts, they don't care about that. What they care is to get the money. And they find all kinds of ways, all kinds of ways to market their products and to cater to them. Now, the question about merchants of cool. In the documentary, what they do, they take young men and women, 24, 25, professionals who graduated with a doctorate degree in psychology or whatever it is, who work for the major TV companies like MTV, like uh, uh, Time Warner, whatever it is that we have out there. And they bring teenagers, 
they bring teenagers, they sit with the teenagers, they give them a certain dollar amount to be in that sitting, setting, and they ask them, what is cool for you? What is cool nowadays among the youth? You remember once, and it's still running, the, the baggy pants that are about falling into, you know, and they walk almost like monkeys, our youth. That was a, a trend. It started and still on. We can still see some of them doing it. It started in the jails, in the prison. Okay? Because they removed the belt from the prisoners. And so it became like a fashion. That you're cool. If you do that, you're cool. Similarly with the hairstyle, similarly with all kinds of fashion of clothing items and, and so on. So it's all about taking care of number one, which is money. We're just here to make money off of you. We're just here to take advantage of you. That's what Dr. Chesney said. And as I said, he's a sociologist well-versed in this. The message that goes out to everyone in that system is, yeah, everyone should be everyone for themselves. Just take care of number one. Why should I care about that other person, you know, What's in it for me? Always money. We are social cre creatures, he said, and that's not a healthy environment. That's what he said. And he said, we are a social creatures. When we stop caring about each other, we just think what happens to us is all that matters. Ah, it creates very unhappy people. They did a study on youth of different countries and the happiest youth, teenagers, Years ago, very, very long ago, before the internet was introduced in the country of Chile, South America, the Chilean youth, they were the happiest amongst all of those who have been studied. Guess what? Once the internet penetrated Chile and the youth had access to it, they had the generation, a new generation of, of very sad youth. I have a question for you. What, what is the reason for that? What's the reason? Why would the youth, a young teenager or young girl or boy, would become sad? Although they are young, they are strong, they have families. We know the answer. We know it. When I look at a celebrity and it becomes my role model, okay, and I try to imitate him or her, depending on the gender, and I still look at my face and it's not like whom I love or whom I like, of course I become sad. Yeah, I don't look like Justin Bieber, man. I want to be like him. Yeah, okay. I don't look like so and so. I want to. This is the problem. This is the problem. They start to have very low self-esteem. They feel broken from inside. And especially if they don't gather enough fans around them, friends who would admire them, and you end up having a literally depressed and ill teenager. She's very, very sad. So we as parents, we have to prepare our kids for that. We have to help them. Don't take any type of role model. Take the right person as a role model and be yourself. You are not so and so. You are who you are. It's very, very important. If we continue here, they ask him, for the parents and teens then, what are the first steps towards eradicating that? How can we remove this completely? This consumerism and so on. He said the first step would be hard to say. I mean, ultimately, I think we have to change the nature of the system. This is deep, brothers, the nature of the system. The system that we live in is extremely insidious, extremely, extremely insidious. And it's very hard to change, and he says it. So I think we have to think big and really get to the root of the problem. Just eliminate the hyper-commercialism aimed at children and teenagers. Who has a young girl, six, seven, eight? What was the effect of the movie Frozen on her, if she ever heard about it? <laughs> I can tell you about my daughter. She was crazy about that. 
to a point where she memorized the, the songs. I don't know how she did. Okay? No matter how hard you're going to monitor them, they will find a way. So the question is what to do. What to do is you sit with them. Because if we were to turn off the internet in the house and no TV, no radio, no access to friends other than just maybe some family members, we are creating a monster. We are creating a monster. At the age of 18, he or she is going to say goodbye. They will. There is a brother who called the Dr. Hamid Ghazali crying, and he said, my son, who is a half of the Quran, he called me and he said, Dad, I am a Christian now. And I asked the question, I asked the question, where is it that the problem happened? where there was a flaw in his education. What parents are not doing enough is to talk to the kids, to communicate with them. Why is it that you like this particular character or that particular item, clothing item? What, tell me more about it. What is so fascinating about the hairstyle? And let them talk, open a communication channel with them. The more they talk, the more they explore to Literally, it's as if it's a beautiful garden, and every now and then there will be weeds. This is how a child is. As they are growing, it's a beautiful garden. A child is like a beautiful garden. We have to take care of it. And you have to remove the weeds. Every day, every day, every day, every day you talk to the child. What did you do at, in the school? What, what was said to you? Who are your friends? Who is this guy that you always speak about, or this girl? Always do that. And then he goes, that's the direction we need to do, but that seems probably far off, maybe even impossible. Even the strength and power of these media, given the strength and power of these media. We have to prepare our kids. Let's look at the social behavior in Islam, what Allah teaches us about the social behavior. I told you once, the ibadat, the acts of worship, it's like 20%. 80% is literally the behavior, is the dealing with others, the dealing with in your business, in, in, in the way we walk, we talk, so on and so forth. Allah reminds us in this surah, He can care less about the orphan. Did you see the one who denies the faith? Have you considered him? He, it is he who mistreats the orphan. Now, if you go back to what Dr. Uh, uh, Chesney said, they don't care. And that's the ex exact attitude that we have. Allah warns us against that. And he does not encourage the feeding of the poor. So woe to those who pray. And at the end, again, and withhold the assistance. That means does not help. Does not help. وَيَمْنَعُونَ الْمَعُونَ Okay. So the true path, the true way in terms of our social uh, behavior, it should be what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to do, to feed the orphan, to treat well others, to take care of those who are in need, the poor, so on and so forth. Because the more we live in a society like the one that we have, the more individualistic we become. It's always I, I, I. Yet in Islam is the opposite. It's we. It's what can we do for you. It's not what you can do for me, I. Allah reminds us, كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَلَوْ آمَنَ أَهْلُ الْكِتَابِ لَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُمْ مِنْهُمْ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَأَكْثَرُهُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ You are the best of the nations that came to mankind. You ordain righteousness and you forbid evil doing. Brothers and sisters, the day we stop doing this, that's the day we will be doomed. Nations before us were doomed because they stopped doing this. That means when we are in the street or in a mall or in our home and we see something wrong outside and we don't try to correct it, then we'll be doomed. I remember an experience, I was still a student in Manhattan, Kansas. 
and uh, there was a nice uh, green, uh, greenish area in the backyard of the, the town home I was living in. And some kids were playing. And then I heard them getting into a fight, so I went out, I stopped the fight, and one of them was very voiceful, had a big mouth, and I told him to stop that, to correct his behavior. He was probably 10 years old. And this happened before Maghrib time. At Isha time, I didn't go to the masjid, I prayed in the, in, in the house, and I, was here, I heard the knocking on the door late night, opened the door, and I found him. I looked behind him, thinking that there would be a parent with him. There was nobody with him. And he told me the following. He said, my father sent me to you to tell you, thank you for helping me with my child, and I'm here to apologize to you. Wallahi al-Azim, Wallahi brother, it brings tears to my eyes. Because there are good people everywhere. And they want you to help them with their kids. They want you, even these are, were not Muslims, by the way. And if we were to go with the skin, it was a white. So all reasons to be more arrogant. No, no. His family was a very decent family. So it touched my heart and I learned then, even more than, now, than, than before, that I have to continue doing that. When I see a, a young boy or a girl doing something wrong, whether they are of the Muslim background or non-Muslims, they are under my responsibility because Allah may ask me on Judgment Day, and He will. You saw something wrong in that behavior. Why you didn't correct the child? And we know very well the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ when he said, مَنْ رَأَ مِنْكُمْ مُنْكَرًا فَلْيُغَيِّرْهُ بِيَدِهِ Whoever sees some wrongdoing in front of him being performed, let him change it with his hands. If he cannot, فَإِن لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ فَبِلِسَانِهِ It's with his tongue that he will change it. فَإِن لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ فَبِقَلْبِهِ وَذَلِكَ أَضْعَفُ الْإِيمَانِ So if he cannot even change that wrongdoing with his tongue, that means by speaking out, then he should change it inside of his heart. اللَّهُمَّ إِنَّ هَذَا مُنْكَرًا لَا تَرْضَاهُ وَلَا أَرْضَاهُ Oh Allah, this is something despiseful that you do not like and I don't like. That is the lowest level of Iman. And that's why I said, once we stop doing this, ordaining the good and forbidding evil, that's when doomsday will be on us. Some examples from the seerah, Umar ibn, uh, ibn Abi Salama, يقول, كنتُ غلاماً. I was a kid. كنتُ غلاماً في حجر رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وكانت يدي يدي تطيش في الصحفة أو الصحن فقال لي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يا غلام سم الله وكل بيمينك وكل مما يليك فما زالت تلك طعمتي بعد It's a beautiful thing It tells us about the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم who never hesitated to help children to give them a moment for them first of all to eat with them because this was not his child Okay Umar ibn Abi Salama said, I was a child on the Prophet's lap, and my hand was all over the dish here and there, eating. So he said to me, Oh kid, say Bismillah, and eat with your right hand, and eat from your side of the dish. From that day on, I always ate the, the way he taught me. He tells us that when we are with children, okay, we monitor them, and we help them in their upbringing. They will remember it for life. If your child is with some social media sitting next to you on Facebook or whatever it is, tell them, can I look at your Facebook, for example, if you're not part of it? They should allow you to befriend them on Facebook. And you, you have the right as parents. You have the right to ask your son or daughter to be part of their group. Because you will see many things that you will be pleased with eventually. And you will also see many things that you're going to tell your child, I want you to be careful about this person. If you befriend this type of person, be very mindful. Very, very mindful. قل للمؤمنين يغضوا من أبصارهم وقل للمؤمنات ويحفظوا فروجهم ذلك أزكى لهم إن الله خبير بما يصنعون 
tell the believers to lower their gaze and to protect their private parts, that is more pure for them. Verily, Allah is all-knowing of what they do. When we are on the internet and looking at something, you notice on the right side, maybe the left, every now and then you have some commercials coming, right? Could be pictures most of the time. And pictures are made to be very powerful, as the Chinese proverb says, one picture is worth 1,000 words. So we have to empower our youth when they see what they are not supposed to see on that right side of the screen or on that ad that pops up. We have to empower them to be able to close that window, to say, no, this is not me. Because if they are not aware of that, it will be one picture and then two pictures and maybe a video clip and maybe a whole movie of what Allah is displeased with. Now, غط al-basar, the lowering of the gaze, it's just amazing, brothers and sisters, if we have sisters listening. غط al-basar, they have found, they did a study, please pay attention, they did a study on 63 individuals, adults, men and women, in which every day they will watch close to three hours of very, very promiscuous type of movies. Bad ones, very bad. And they did some scanner of their brain. At the end of the study, over so many days, the gray matter in the brain shrunk. The gray matter in the brain shrunk. The study is out there on Google. What is the gray, any doctor here? What is the gray matter in our brain? responsible for. It's easy. When somebody does something silly, we tell them, hey, you have no gray matter. Gray matter. It's intelligence. It's intelligence. Yes. The gray matter in the brain, it's the source of intelligence, of the ability to think critically. Okay? So if it shrinks just from the viewing of bad videos, promiscuous videos, Imagine what it does to, to our young generation of kids. If they are into that, you have literally an addicted individual whom at a certain age, is, that's it, is lost. So we parents should be aware of that. And that's why probably the verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, يَغُطُّ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ Brother, don't just look at a, a, a woman and start scanning her up and down. Just lower your gaze. Lower your gaze, and we need to teach this to the youth. Okay? And the Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qal, Ya Ali, this was Ali radiallahu anhu was walking with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and a woman passed by. This is, by the way, it's a hadith, it's there, you can verify it. It's Rawahu Ahmad, it's from Ahmad uh, wa Tirmidhi wa Abu Dawood. And he saw Ali, a young man, very strong, very handsome. And the lady was passing by. Ali looked at her. So she went, uh, crossing each other. And yet Ali turned and he looked one more time. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ told him. Ya Ali, O oh Ali, la tattabi' an-nadra, an-nadar, an-nadrata. Fa'inna laka al-ula, wa laysat laka al-akhira. Said, O oh Ali, do not follow the look, looking at someone, meaning looking at that woman, by another look, the first look is for you, but not the second one. So we have to teach this also to our kids. They have to learn that proper behavior. Okay? Because if they look and look and look, then the next thing is we can just imagine. All right? And when I say they look, it's not necessarily a living human being. It could be through any social media. It could be through TV. It could be through any program. Now, I was telling our brother, uh, doctor, remind me, you're, uh, he's, he's busy on his phone. <laughs> I was telling him when we talked earlier, remind me your name, please. Ayas? Mashallah. Uh, he's, he is a professor at OSU. 
I was telling him, I'm not of those who say no to TV, no to the internet in the house, no. I am of those who say yes for that, but under some supervision. Until you trust your son or daughter when they are in their room, you're done with that part. Now, if they go beyond that, that will be their problem. Allahumma inni balikht. Oh Allah, I have taught, taught them. But you should sit with them. And you watch a movie, in fam family movie, let's do that. And if there is a bad scene that catches you, that's when you stop it and you discuss it. Why? When we are watching TV, by the way, a movie has about 30 frames per second. Our brain can process only 15. The other 15, they are stored somewhere. <laughs> okay? So, there are many things that we may see, we may internalize, but we later on they will act, we will act upon them. Notice the commercials for beer, for example. You have this nice ambience, nice quote-unquote, you know, lights and, uh, you know, a bar, whatever it is. And you have this very sporty guy who comes in. And, of course, we know what's around him. And he just makes a statement. Give me a whatever it is. And that is repeated on and on during the whatever program there is going to be stopped and they hit you. And the commercial hits at the moment where you are very, very focused. They know. It's been studied, by the way. They study the human behavior. They know exactly at what point of that movie you're going to be so hooked to it. And they hit you with the commercial. And once they hit, it hits hard. And we internalize it. We internalize it. Could it be that later that that person is going to say the same statement, entering the same type of environment? Yes, I promise you that. Okay? So we have to be careful about that. Um, this is a verse in Surah Ibrahim. And they have plotted their own plan, and with Allah is their plan. And verily, their plan is such that mountains can be removed because of the evil of their plan. It is very evil because those commercials, those marketing companies, they can, they can do it differently. But what they play on is on the desires of the human being. Those deep desires that are so powerful in the human being that the tendency is to take that route instead of the, the, more, the, the more righteous route, the more, uh, uh, the more pure, the purer one. Okay? I finish with this. If you have any question, I know we're going to have prayer soon. Anyone? I hope it helped. Yes, brother. very wrong very wrong nobody will take care of your kids better than you one even if it's their uncle or their grandparents that's one second the technology is everywhere in Africa and you are like me from Africa in the depths of some of the countries that are the most remote the technology of computer is being introduced with the internet. So the thing is, brothers and sisters, we can't control a human being. You can't. You can't. Even your own son, you cannot. Your own daughter, you cannot control them. You guide them. This is what the prophets, salam, all did. He said, the prophet said, Oh, my people, follow me. He didn't say, you must, you must, you must. The Prophet ﷺ did not destroy the idols inside of the Kaaba and outside of the Kaaba from the moment he received the Risala. It took years. And he, he did just one. He, he just broke one. And the rest of the believers who were with him, the Sahaba al-Kiram, started breaking them. So he guided them. It took him years to get to that point. So to send our kids overseas, maybe a short period of time to learn the language, maybe to learn the culture, but for a long period of time, 
I mean, their uncle, you, you think he's going to be always watchful? No. Their aunt? No. 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 Thank you. Thank you. There are countries overseas I ran away from. Yeah, and I did. To what? You send them for a while and then they come back. Yes. Yes. It doesn't. Uh, I had a student from a boarding school, I'm not going to say up north, who came to study in Texas. Health program. After a while, we had to, to expel him. He was in a boarding school, like a dorm, and it was very good. I mean, look at the program. I'm not going to say that. Okay. It was so ugly. I was shocked. We were shocked, myself and his teacher of Hif. Why? Because he was just by himself in a dorm, parents' supervision, none. His parents lived in a different state. We don't do that to our kids. And that's why I started the very first verse, if you remember. Oh, you who believe, protect yourself your families, those human beings and stones, okay? You can go with them, spend some time with them, okay? But you come back all together. In psychology as well, they all know that the most influential environment on a child is the family. Many people think, oh, he's learning a lot of bad things from the school. But still, the family environment is the most influential environment on the child. Any other question? I don't know if they have a mic. If no other question, Jazakumullah khair.